what I really like about property management is we're sitting here, we're talking in the podcast. I have a COO, I have nine VAs, two area managers. I have the whole team doing all the work. People think that to buy a management company, you need to have like crazy amounts of money. Dude, with an SBA loan, you can put down like as low as like twenty to $50,000. I want everybody to know that it's so freaking accessible. Welcome back everyone to the Learn Like a CPA podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Bakey, and today, very special guest on Patrick Switek from San Diego. Pat's the man. Patrick, how are we doing today? Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, definitely, this is right after the conference, so my voice is a little gone, uh, but I'm going to do my best to give you guys so much insight into a little bit about short-term rental property management companies and you know, maybe give you a little bit of background on my story. So tell us about your story and how you what your, your first job was to now what you do. Yeah, so when I started, I was 14 years old when I built my first company. Um, I was 14 years old, I uh, made $40,000 a year selling server space online to gamers. And so I was doing that for a while. Uh, and from there, I transitioned into um, you know college, going down the path of, you know this is freedom, going to college, getting good grades, you know, getting a nice job, and I did exactly that. Went to college, got good grades. I did a lot of entrepreneurial things as well that didn't really work out, but I eventually ended up working as a product manager tech uh, for a short-term rental company called Avanste. So I helped them scale uh, in 2018, 2019, I helped them scale from 200 to 1,000 plus units. And that's my beginning exposure to short-term rentals. So I saw a LinkedIn post that you had a couple weeks ago. So you said that you're the worst employee ever. Can you, can you explain that a little bit more? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was a pretty bad employee. Um, when when Avance happened, um, <clears throat> not only was I just not really happy with what I was doing, but I was just not the best person to to work with. Um, I always questioned everything. I never took everything face value. I always uh, made sure to see what ways I could improve it, what ways um, I wanted to know what the top dogs were talking about. And I've had people tell me like, can you just do your job? Mm. <laughs> so I was just not a really good employee in that sense. Um, I uh, also got really bored easily. Uh, so I got fired from three jobs in one year. So that would, that's happened during COVID, got, got fired, laid off, got fired again, got a job, got fired again, got a job, got fired again, all in one year. Well, uh, I think about being a business owner, the hardest thing is like hiring and training employees to do a specific role or job. I mean, at the truest sense, there's a reason that they're an employee and not an owner, right? Because they have, they, they have good technical skills, but they might lack entrepreneurship. And so the hardest thing is like hiring people to do a job, also expecting them to do other things and it just doesn't work out. Like that's the only reason I've ever had to let people go or move, move separate ways. It's just sometimes I just need them to put their head down and work. Sometimes I need their creative brain, but it doesn't work like that. You have to hire different people for different roles. 100%. And I think that's where my, like nobody was using my skill set to the best of his advantage. I was a really good at managing teams. So um, I did get one job that I ended up keeping and it was managing a team of people and I had to build out the team of VAs. I learned how to hire VAs. I learned how to scale a department and that's where I was a very effective employee. Um, so to say that I was the worst employee in every capacity is not true. Um, but yeah, to your, to your point. So talk a little bit about your first deal. Yeah, so... At that point, I realized I wanted to change my life. Uh, I wanted to get into short-term rental investing, and I bought a cabin in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee with uh, Avery Carl's team, and that was my introduction to short-term rentals. What was the purchase price? Purchase price was three hundred thirty-four thousand. We put a hundred thousand dollars into it, and then we, or hold on, sorry, I'm talking about a recent deal. Uh, you bought it by yourself, right? I bought it for three hundred six. Okay. $306,000 uh, by myself, 10% uh, down. And uh, I used all the money that I made through uh, the business in high school to pay for it. What did it gross the first year? Uh, well, the previous owner made 33000 I did sixty. Wow. 
Did you end up selling that? I thought you sold that one. Yeah. Uh, eventually, I had a conversation with you. Uh, you introduced me to the concept of ROE. So you did have an influence in that decision to sell. ROE basically means return on equity. It's what you were talking about. And I had $175,000 sitting there that was only returning me $20,000 net. Right. So I thought it'd be more powerful to sell the business. And I bought a property manager company with that money. When did I tell you that? Do you remember? Last year at the conference. Oh, wow. So, yeah, yeah. So if you have 175000 of equity, but it's only making, you said, twenty grand a year? Yeah. Yeah, it would take you, uh, I mean, it would take you almost 10 years to break even on what you could walk right. away with. I mean, but I gained, I gained equity in the property over time, too. Yeah. So it was just cash sitting there. Right. So talk about the first property management company. Yeah, or did you, so, didn't you start doing co-hosting and property management? No. So I was actually looking for co-hosting, right? Okay. I realized I started buying these properties with another uh, business guy uh, named Josh. He was a flipper. He's flipped over 100 houses. And we did a lot of um, gut renovations to get these pro- – ba- I basically bought five properties that way, is using somebody else's money. Mm. And that was my year, right? And then – him and I basically thought, well, we need cash flow. Like, why are we buying these properties and strapping up so much cash in these properties and, uh, yeah. and then making a thousand, two thousand a month, right? Yeah, some properties will make maybe more than that, um, but COVID days are over, right? So I needed cash flow. I didn't need a thousand dollars a month. I'd rather take that same cash to get one Airbnb at a thousand dollars a month and put it and, and get appreciation and. All the benefits of real estate and taxes, great. But what I really needed is cash flow. And so that's why taking that same money instead of buying a property management company allowed me to get 15 properties averaging me $1,000 a month. So I made $15,000 top line revenue at this management company versus, you know, with this, with this Airbnb. So that management company you bought, right? Yeah, so I bought the management company. The way it came about was I was actually looking for co-host clients and somebody came up to me and told me that they had 15 co-host clients that they're looking to uh, get rid of. And I never knew, I didn't know anything about buying a management company and I decided to take it on and, and it was a successful venture. I learned a lot. And since then I've bought another management company and I'm currently in escrow, my third. What was the biggest lesson from the first one? The biggest lesson was... Hey guys, just wanted to interrupt the podcast today to let you know about my Facebook group, Tax Strategies for Real Estate Investors. We have over 6,300 real estate investors in the community actively engaging every single day. You're going to learn all my top tips. You're going to get to network with other professionals and you're going to get to see all the past recordings and all the past posts in that Facebook group. So make sure you join today. It's going to be linked in the podcast below. And now back to the show. The biggest lesson was definitely... There's a lot of lessons. Um, I'll give you guys kind of the rundown of how I structured the first deal. The first deal, um, it was 15 contracts. We uh, put 50% down seller financing, right? And uh, on the back end, we pay out after the first year on the back end, depending on how many of those clients stay. So that was 50% of, uh, like, how did you value the overall business? The business we valued at like three to four X a bit, uh, Mm. something around there. That's, that's what a a guy I was talking to last night said he bought one for three and a half X a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to the same person. Did you learn about structuring the deal or what was the biggest lesson? So I think I over, I overvalued it. Okay. And, and I'll talk to you why I overvalued it. I overvalued it, and I also, uh, I also bought a business that was supposed to be manager-run, and it was not like that at all. So I was basically having to step in and do what the owner was supposed to do. So when I valued the business, I didn't do any seller ad backs. Mm. So in this case, me running this business, one of the owners was doing accounting in-house. Wow. And, the, and the owner's statements. That's a lot of work. Another owner was doing all the, the guest communication stuff. So that's a lot of work. So now I had to do that. Meaning that it's not worth what they said it was worth. You see what I mean? So like the, yeah, the 4X EBITDA probably makes sense if it's, if it's a company. not owner run, right? Mm-hmm. 
So what are, I guess, what are some of the things that you will do, I guess that you might've did on your second, third, Yeah. how do you know, like, how can you get into the nitty gritty of yeah, how much is this, about it. how much time is this guy spending a day? Yeah. So I think the way you, you should do it is, um, and there's a lot of ways to do it, but anything that's under 30, like contracts or units, um, you want to value it at per contract basis. That's just because contracts are really the main thing you're buying. And so it's kind of like buying a book of business, right? Um, and the the price that people usually say for contracts is between one to one and a half of the management revenue. So if the business or if that contract property makes $100,000 a year and you get 25% uh, management fee is $25,000 is the valuation, uh, between 25,000 and 37,500. Cause there's no guarantee that that client actually stays on. So that's why you exactly. built, you built into that, uh, sort of like an earn out. Like, you can do earn outs. You can say, well, look, half of it, I'll pay you up front based on this valuation. And then the second half, whatever, where it gets really interesting is I will buy contracts and let's say I buy a contract for 20,000, right? And I end up doing 50% better just by revenue strategy alone. Right. Now I just got, a t I pay my payback period just went down tremendously. I can get that paid back in faster period of time. And on top of that, I get to own that contract for a lot, for, for as long as I want to. Right. Um, a lot of really cool things you can do. You can renegotiate contracts. You can get them into one, two year commitments. Um, my second company that I bought was a contract buyout. The way I did it with that was a really good deal. So this company was going under. And I saw that that was an opportunity to come in and pick up some of these clients. So <clears throat> while the other sharks were waiting uh, around, waiting for this company to crumble, um, I decided to make the proactive effort to actually reach out to the owner. And instead of trying to pick off clients one by one, I asked him to collaborate with me on you know buying it out. Mm -hmm. um, and so... This guy took a high interest loan during COVID um, to pay for his management company and all these other things that you shouldn't do. And it bit him in the butt when 2023 rates started dropping. And he locked these people in at 30%. Mm. But these people weren't getting paid for six to nine months wow. because they froze all of his assets and he wasn't getting payouts. And these owners weren't getting paid in six, six to nine months. So you know how easy it is to sell somebody? that hasn't been getting paid six to nine months. Mm. Hey, I'm going to pay you on time, you know? Um, but uh, it was a sad situation, of course. Um, that was the second one you bought? Second one. And so the way I structured it is I came up to him and said, hey, listen, you're not going to get any money off of this. Zero. Let's just be real. But you're going to save it, his ass pretty much. Yeah. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to actually pay you. But I can't pay you right away because I don't know, first of all, if they're going to sign on with me. So that's one mm -hmm. of the factors. And the second factor, I don't know if they're going to stay on with me long enough to, to pay off the, the debt or whatever. So I told him, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll give you 0% down, but 10% of what I make in perpetuity mm. on all the contracts that come in. So 30%, he's getting around, you know, 3% of, you know, 10% of 30 is 3% every month he's getting. Who is helping you structure the contracts? Do you have like an attorney? No need for that because they're reassigning with me. So with a contract buyout, you can actually do either an assign. So there's two ways to do it. One is you just assign them into your own contract, into your own company. Mm -hmm. So there's no, nothing legal there. Um, or second, which is what I did. Or second, you can actually assign those contracts. Um, and the, the own, technically, if there's no assignability clause in the contract, and I'm not a lawyer. In the, in the original contract. In the original contract yeah. that they have with the owner. What you can do is you can come in as the operator and you get the transfer of the contract. Um, with And that agreement is done between the other manager and you. So the owner doesn't have to sign off on it. Because the, the duty to fulfill that contract, that agent work, can be done by somebody else, mm. technically. I see. But they still have the option to leave, of course, and all that. What about so you do you do some coaching in the space too for short term rental? Mm -hmm. Do you teach people how to get their first property or like first couple mm -hmm. of properties? 
Yeah, no, I, I do coaching like one-on-one. Uh, I am going to be releasing some more information on how to buy management companies and things of that nature. I found this to be a very interesting space. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of value add you can do in this space. Uh, I'm currently in my third one. I've learned a lot. Uh, the third one I'm, I'm buying at an EBITDA, right? A, a multiple of the EBITDA because it's a big enough company. Uh, the company makes, um, you know, it makes a lot of money. Uh, I can't disclose it yet. Um, it makes a lot of money, but let's say that, for example, <clears throat> it makes $500,000 net, right? And like I said earlier, if I can make 50% more money, now my business valuation goes up. The cool thing with having more properties is you can actually... Um, you can actually, you know, I, I actually looked into the difference between companies that sell 2x multiples and 7x multiples. And I started looking, researching it deeply. I'm like, how do I sell at a 7x multiple? Because if I'm doing all this work with this company and I'm only going to be able to, and I, and I get it up to $500,000 net revenue and I can only sell it for a million, like what could I have done differently to allow it to be sold at that 7x multiple, right? Which would be tremendously increase the value of the business on a time of sale. And so looking into that, like I want to teach other people doing that kind of stuff. And that's very interesting to me. Uh, but contracts are a big part of it. We, we talked a little bit about like the difference between a consulting or a coaching business versus a, a sticky business, like a property management company. Mm -hmm. um, kind of just... Like you make good money in coaching and consulting, but that's really the hardest to kind of scale out of because people want to work with you and not somebody else. Oh, I understand. Yeah, we talked about this. We had we grabbed dinner. We talked about this over over steaks, which was really nice, <laughs> and lobster. But I think about but, um, I think about it a lot. But yeah, no, exactly that, right? Like coaching's great because it's it's high cash flow. Um, you know, it's it's low low mar or it's high margins. Um, but what I really like about property management is... Hey guys, just want to interrupt the podcast to let you know that if you enjoy the podcast and the content that's in it, you would love my Tax Strategy Academy. This is going to give you the framework for developing all your tax plans for the entire year, whether you're a long-term rental, short-term rental investor. You're going to get a one-on-one -on -one call with me to map out your tax plan, and you're going to get access to weekly office hours where you can come and ask your personal questions. So if you're interested in learning more, go check out the link in the show notes below. And now back to the show. But what I really like about property management is we're sitting here, we're talking on the podcast. I have a COO. I have uh, nine VAs. I have um, two area managers. I have the whole team doing all the work. And I'm here sitting and talking to you about mm -hmm. how to buy property management companies. I'm thinking about higher level strategies. You know, it, it's like you can't really take yourself out of the business that way. Um, like with coaching and when you can take yourself out of the business, what happens to the valuation of the business, the moment you can take yourself out of the business and whoever buys it knows that they're not buying themselves a job. Mm -hmm. That means you're a lot more of a sellable business. That's right. And that's, and that's the key thing. And that's the reason where anybody, if you have an area of expertise and you're doing a service, you want to eventually step away from that service aspect, not only because of um, <clears throat> you know your time, but once you sell the business, it's going to give you a higher valuation right off the bat. That's right. Yeah. What what's a what's one big tip that you've learned that you want everybody to to know? I want everybody to know that any uh, for me the biggest thing I learned is that it's so freaking accessible. People think that to buy a management company you need to have like crazy amounts of money, dude. If with an SBA loan, you can put down you can put down like as low as like even like. Twenty to fifty thousand dollars, which is like a first property yeah. for somebody to buy an existing business that makes that cash flow back for you, and and honestly, your your cash on cash is much higher. Yes, granted, you're going to be working a little bit more in the business in the beginning, but that's like the beauty of it. Like you can get you can make your cash back a lot quicker. You can make your cash back in in you know I mean short amount of time, right? So. Uh, the biggest tip is, is is definitely the fact that, you know, Vacasa, everybody else is doing it. They're acquiring businesses. Why not bring power to the people? You could do the same exact thing and, and buy cash flow. Where can listeners of the podcast find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram. I think that's the best. Um, it's Patrick, P-A-T-R-Y-K 
underscore S W I E T E K and soft, you know, uh, if you're really interested in, in this in general, I have a Facebook group on buy and basically buying and selling property management companies. Awesome. So you can check that out. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, of course.